I'm talking about infrastructure as actual code today, and I will explain what that means. But before we get there, I want to have a maybe rhetorical question, and that is the question that's almost as old as the term architect, and that is, should architects actually code? And you know, with the introduction, you guys probably have a good guess where I stand on this, and I say, yes, absolutely, architects should code, but they shouldn't code to deliver code like they you know there's other people who deliver software better than the architects do but by diving down in the engine room and actually building things a the architects get a really valuable reality check like you know, we just heard from dave right sometimes things are burning sometimes they're they're cooking right so you need to see what reality is like so you don't drift up into the ivory tower and you bring things back with you from the engine room like you see things when you go down to the code level you see things as an architect that not everybody else might see and that is useful insight that you can replay back to other folks so it's not about delivering the code in the engine room but it's bringing new insights back with you and the talk we have today here is exactly one of those insights now i work at aws and one of the things I feel strongly about is, well, you shouldn't be working for a product company without actually using their product. So you know, last year I sat down and said, OK, look, let me go build some applications on AWS. And I was like, well, you know, let me use some of the, the more advanced, some of the more fun stuff. So obviously I do this using serverless. And then I wanted to automate that code. And out of this came the story that you're going to hear today that I brought back with me from the engine room. As a quick sort of completing the introduction, I also like to write books. So apparently I've done a lot of things in my past, you know, from you know consulting to Silicon Valley to startups to sort of big enterprise IT. Um, I like connecting the dots between those environments and I like to write about what I learned. So a long time ago I've written about you know message distributed messaging oriented systems with Bobby Wolf. And amazingly that's still quite relevant today. Then I'm very keen on the role of architects in architecture, and that's my book, The Architect Elevator. And then, you know, not surprisingly, I also have thoughts on, you know, different point of view on cloud and cloud strategy. So that's another book of mine. And interestingly, today's talk really pulls from all three of those books that now span over, yeah, just about two decades here. So the good news is some stuff in IT actually passes the the test of time, we don't have to reinvent everything every year. The vocabulary and the APIs change change all the time. But I think some of our architecture knowledge actually lasts quite a long while. At least that's my experience with the enterprise integration patterns. So as an industry, we tend to not do so great with naming. And yeah, I already gave you sort of an example, serverless, right? Obviously, serverless doesn't mean there are no servers, so that's not such a great name. And I feel that infrastructure as code might also not be the luckiest wording that we've ever created. Well, yeah, there's a lot of examples. It seems to be a weak spot in our industry that we struggle with naming. And in this case, I feel that with modern cloud applications, it's totally not just about infrastructure. Just you know, think about it. Serverless, as poor as the name might be, wants to tell us that it's not about infrastructure. So if we're automating serverless things, right, it should be more than just infrastructure. Otherwise, it'd be a little bit self-contradictory. And I would also posit that a lot of the automation tools that we used to use, they're not so much really code. They more look like a document. I'm a bit older. You know, so they remind me of XML generally. So I would like automation to be just more as actual code. The way I write my applications, I don't write my applications in JSON and YAML. You know, I write them in Python or TypeScript or Java, whatever it might be. So if it's supposed to be code, why isn't it you know, Python or TypeScript or Java? So with that premise that we're going to debunk this, this moniker and replace it with something more meaningful, we'll go into our cloud automation talk. And automation isn't sort of a new topic, right? So if you look back the history of automation, we learned very quickly that doing things automated saves us manual labor. And that's really the history of automation. We try to make things more, more cheaply by reducing manual steps and replacing them with automated steps. You know, that worked well for the sort of Ford Model T some hundred years ago, 
but we shouldn't fall into the trap to believe that cloud automation is only there for the same purpose. Because I do hear these arguments sometimes, oh, you're trying to automate things because you're trying to take my job as an IT admin or as a sys admin away. That was 100 years ago, right? Now we have very different motivations. One motivation we have is speed. Yeah, we need to deliver solutions and things faster. So automation makes us move faster. It also improves the quality. It improves the repeatability. Automated deployments are guaranteed to run the same way the last 999 deployments would happen. If you do that manually, I guarantee you that will not be the case. And that's you know, related to one of my popular matrix quotes, right? Never send a human to do a machine's job. If you want to do a machine's job, send the machines to do that. And that is automation. And that gives you repeatability. A much underappreciated benefit of automation is confidence. If you want to move quickly, you got to have confidence. If you're not sure whether your stuff is going to work, then you're not going to be confident. You're going to hesitate and you're going to slow down. So automation gives you this confidence that you can move quickly. And it does allow you to work in entirely new ways. For example, if you're highly automated, you can dispose resources and re create them. It's sort of you know, the cattle versus pet analogy. I'm as a vegetarian, don't like that so much. But you know, you can, if you need something, you can just get rid of the old one and recreate a new one rather than keep patching and maintaining things. And that way you always have a clean instance. And you can really do that only if you're highly automated. And last but not least, automated processes are also more transparent. How often do you deploy? What's the percentage of redeploys that you have? Because you had some issue with it. If it's automated, all that stuff is apparent. You know, if it's done by hand, you will get some sort of evasive answers. Oh, it works like most of the time, kind of, sort of, right? So automation has many, many more benefits. We're not after efficiency here. We're after a different way of working. We're after giving team confidence, and we're after increased transparency. So with that background, I would go as far in saying that if you took automation out of the cloud, you're most likely don't have a cloud anymore, your IT starts looking much more like the good old data center. And I haven't found anybody who is keen to have yet another data center. So I consider automation a defining quality of the cloud. It's not some convenience or some add-on. That is what defines working in a cloud operating model. Now, I mentioned at the beginning about architects. I mentioned the architect elevator and the benefits of diving into the engine room and having the point of view of an architect. So let's apply the architect's point of view to automation. And here's sort of a little pitch from my side for the role of an architect. The architects, we often draw pictures, we have models, I like to call them, and often we take a higher level view. Right? We abstract things out, we zoom things out. That's what we as architects do. And there's a common misconception that when you zoom out, you lose detail. There's sort of a common misconception that you're not conveying as much because you omitted some things. But I find that to be totally the opposite. If you raise the level of abstraction, if you amplify the important things and get rid of the noise, you actually deepen your thinking. You can think much more clearly and deeply about the systems exactly by removing all the noise, right? You can finally see the forest for the trees. So this architect maneuver of zooming out and abstracting is actually a really useful one and it doesn't lose information. It actually makes us see things that we otherwise might not have seen. So let's apply this to automation, right? We all write like Terraform and cloud formation scripts, right? Why are we doing this and what are the tasks that we accomplish with this? And I believe that can break down into four distinct objectives that we have. Well, the first one that's fairly obvious is provisioning. And I made up sort of a trivial example here, right? You have sort of two virtual machines, maybe EC2 instances. You have some load balancing, some gateway in front of it, maybe some sort of very basic application that you're building. So you need to provision some hardware, right? Here's your virtual machines, right? But that alone doesn't do anything except maybe cost you some money in the cloud. So you should definitely deploy some software on the resources that you provision, right? And that you do with automation scripts also. But in isolation, 
these virtual machines and the software on there won't do anything. You need to wire this together, right? You need an endpoint. The gateway routes things to the load balancer. The load balancer talks to the virtual machines. Without that composition, again, this thing does nothing and just costs you money. So composition is the third one. And the last one is more likely than not, even though you might deploy identical images, you probably going to have some slight variations in configuration, right? Whether this is between staging and production, you have primaries and secondaries. Some things talk to that database instance, other things talk to that database instance. Yeah, you're provisioning keys, secrets, etc. Yeah, invariably, there's going to be some configuration that you do. And we'll come back to this later as we see that having this breakdown of automation is actually a very helpful mental model to understand that this is not your you know, your old shell script kind of thing, right? That this plays a very different role in your application delivery cycle. Now I've made another statement about architects, and that is that architects live in the first derivative. I've said, I've gone as far as saying, if you have absolutely no change in your systems, you probably don't need a lot of architecture, right? You just get it running somehow and it'll keep running. Now, Luckily for us architects, that's a relatively poor assumption these days because everything tends to be changing. And the same is true for infrastructure as code or for cloud automation, like I like to call it. And the you know, good friend with Keith Morris, so he wrote the defining book on infrastructure as code back in 2016. And what we can learn here is that when he published the second edition late in 2020, the title of the book stayed the same, which you know, they tend to be sort of immutable if you wish, right? But the subtitle of the book changed in very important ways. And the publisher once told me that the subtitle is actually the thing that tells you most about the book because the title is more like to get attention or SEO kind of thing. So it used to be about managing servers in the cloud, uh -huh, infrastructure service, and now it's about dynamic systems for the cloud age. So apparently Keith agrees that it's not just about servers, even though yeah, he couldn't really change the title. And he also talks about dynamic systems. So he increasingly talks about how you automate in the face of change, not just static things. So me, what's very interesting, to see this, what seems like a nuance, actually being an important shift that we're talking about managing change here. Well, and in automation land, change comes in many different forms. Here are just three examples, right? We often just think about functional change. We need to add a feature, that's certainly a kind of change or a new instance, a new microservice, a new Lambda function, right? So these are all changes to our application. Of course, there's also changes to the environment we're running in, you know, dev, test, pre-prod, prod, right? That is also a progression, a change to our application. And then lastly, sometimes our application is all happy and fine, but the reality changes because somebody goes in one of the servers and you know, makes an emergency patch or tinkers with something. We sometimes call this the configuration drift. That is also a way of change. And now the way we deal with this change when we do automation is that rather than making a shell script type of automation where we say do A, B, and C, we rather use declarative provisioning. And virtually all cloud automation tools do it this way because it's the only way that works well with change. So rather than telling the system what it should be doing, we tell the system the target state. I need a load balancer and two VMs. What the system then can do, it can look at the current state, calculate the delta, and could basically derive the actual actions behind it that are going to be needed to bring the current state into the desired state, right? And that's the way many, many systems work, whether it's Kubernetes or whether it's most of our cloud automation systems, because this is the thing that deals best with change. Because if I need a third server, what kind of automation script would I have to write? In this case, I just changed the number of servers from two to three, and the system will figure out that you might have had one or two before, and it can totally see the difference between them. What's important though, and what I think gets often falsely conflated is that this way of declarative provisioning has nothing to do with the type of language that you use to declare the desired state. That's two pairs of shoes. The declarative provisioning is an approach by 
defining a desired state, comparing against the actual state and deriving the task versus a declarative language is a programming language choice. We define data structures in all sorts of programming languages. I can declare a desired state in an object-oriented language, in a procedural language, in a functional language. You know, in any language, I can make a data structure. So my important point here is do not conflate declarative provisioning, which we essentially all use to deal with change, with using document-oriented or sometimes called declarative languages. So you don't need to have stuff in YAML in order to use declarative provisioning. And we'll see very soon yeah, what great things we can do if we don't use a document-oriented language. Or to just make a little bit of fun of documented-oriented languages, I found this really old uh, blog post by Charles Pets Petzold, people who've done a lot of Windows development in the old days will know his name very well, right? One of the most respected figures in Windows land. And yeah, look at the date here. Well, A, it's 2016, so this is a good while ago. And look at the, the months and dates. So take it with a grain of salt. This is an April 1st kind of post. But he said, hey, why are we writing these weird expressions? Why do I need to write something like A equals 5 times open parentheses B plus 27 times C if I can express the same thing in this beautiful document? Right. And of course, it's a complete joke because it's hideous. And if you think like, yeah, this is like the old farts, you know, like Charles Pessel or Gregor or they for that argument's sake, right, who deal with this old XML kind of thing, I am much cooler. I do this in JSON or YAML. The bad news for you is no, this is no different in JSON or YAML. You're basically doing the same thing. And sometimes it makes sense, but sometimes it absolutely makes no sense, right? There is a reason we have expressions like this and we don't need 30 lines of a structured document to add and multiply two numbers. So with that, back to the choice of automation language, which we learned is independent of being of using declarative provisioning, right? And yeah, we do have a lot of languages that are document oriented or sometimes called declarative. I prefer the term document oriented so we don't muddle the two things, right? And these are you know, the JSONs and, and YAMLs. And that's good, right? Like we, my, my employer pays, pays my salary, right? We have one cloud formation, that's great. Terraform, super popular. So it works for many cases. There's also some little bit rare instances of functional language. You think like, oh, if I need to actually calculate data structures and I need to manu manipulate lists and calculate elements you know, across a large set of infrastructure, a functional language can actually be a great asset. I can do things like maps and reduce and I can flatten arrays and all these kind of things. So there are actually some languages who follow that route. The one that I use most extensively is proprietary, it's BCL, it's the Borg config language. I actually liked it a lot. You can find a redacted PhD thesis about this that tells you a little bit what, P what, what BCL was about, but I thought it was a great language to define um, configuration data sets for large fleets of of resources because you know list and data manipulation is very natural in this kind of functional language. There's some efforts to sort of bring this back. I need to spend a bit more time. There's a language, an effort called Q that's looking to bring this more on the mainstream. So you know, maybe something for next year's talk. And then of course, the language that we write most of our applications in, and those tend to be the object-oriented languages. And the reason object-oriented languages are so popular because they help us deal with complexity. They give us nice mechanisms to abstract things away. We have inheritance, we have polymorphism, we have classes. So these are all ways to build software that's bigger than our brains in a way, right? We need some things that help us abstract and simplify and reduce the complexity because the complexity of the domain otherwise will not fit in our own heads. And that's a great thing. And that's why most of the systems we use today are written in those kind of languages. So right? Pulumi is, is a great example, independent vendor. And then there's AWS CDK, and there's also CDK for Terraform, which just went GA, well, I think less than a month or just about a month ago, right? So there's, again, you have, you have choices for each approach. So let's look at the CDK a little bit. You know, that's closest to my home. Um, that's just what I happen to use during my engine room deep dive, right? And I would say with CDK, things start to look like much more as automation as 
actual cost. So a very simple example here of what you can do in CDK, you can start deploying a VPC, a virtual private cloud, right? This is a construct that you have, and it looks like a normal line of code, but behind this would actually sit a very large amount of automation code. I think the VPC construct alone is about 270 lines of cloud formation code or document. You could say, okay, but maybe it's a little bit verbose, but no matter how verbose it is, like turning 270 lines into one line is definitely a good thing to do. Yeah, and then you can reference this VPC just like a variable in the next line, right? So I create an EC2 cluster in this VPC, and this is all like writing totally normal code. And then I can use higher level patterns. And I joked before we struggled with naming. So here's something that's a bit of a mouthful. It's a network load balance Fargate service, and you might joke at the name. But in the end, this does something very, very useful. It gives you a higher level abstraction of something that I want to create. And under the covers, it actually provisions different resources, right? It has the Fargate. It has you know, the, the network mapping in front of it. So you can express your infrastructure in higher level abstractions, just like you would do in any other OO language. And of course, because you're, you're writing this as, as regular code, you have all the other things in your IDE, like autocomplete and all the things that are used to refactoring, syntax highlighting, all, all the kind of things that you would do when you write regular code. And to be honest, I like this quite a lot because when I do infrastructure as actual code, if I'm coding my automation, you know, I am very fond of these kind of things. So I'd like to have them not only for my application code, I also like to have them for my automation code. But right? you can do this across an increasing variety of languages, right? This is you know, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, C Sharp, and Go is, I uh, believe, still in preview. So most popular modern languages you can use CDK. It's essentially a programming library, and you use the languages the same way you would use them anyhow. So having given that intro, it's good to understand that there's sort of three major parts that make CDK so interesting. You know, the first one is the constructs. The second one is all open source. There's the whole ecosystem. And then there's the object-oriented part that I'll speak to last. So the constructs is we divide CDK library in three different levels. You could say levels of abstraction, and I'll comment more on that later. The first one is, well, it's like your, your cloud formation resources, right? I live in serverless land, so the level one constructs, you know, they're like an SQS you know, channel, they're an SNS queue, they're a Lambda function, they're step functions, you know, workflow instance, right? It's an EC2. It's basically the AWS service vocabulary, right? That's level one. Then level two, you have a little bit higher level constructs. This might be things like Lambda SQS Lambda. I want to have two serverless functions connected by a queue. I want to do this more easily. So I have these kind of constructs. And then you have things on top of that. And we've already seen that with, oh, I need to remember the name, the, the network balance Fargate, Fargate service, right? Where, where we say like, here's a thing that we think is a good combination, something opinionated, and that doesn't use the language, well, magically uses the language of the services underneath because it still says Fargate, right? I would have chosen something different, but basically it can give you a higher level construct. And CDK has all of these examples at all levels. But we didn't have, we as an AWS, we didn't have to make all of those because there's an open source ecosystem behind it. And in one hand, that means the CDK development itself is open and shared, but it also means there's a lot of community and third party sites where people make their own constructs or their own things, right? Here's, for example, CDK patterns, right? This is from our friends at, at Liberty Mutual who define their own patterns. It's all open, it's a regular programming language. So if you think the you know, network balance Fargate service, whichever one it was called, if you don't think that's the, the, the service you want or the abstraction you want, you just go and make your own. So this is what makes this so powerful that you have an open, open ecosystem where you can do that. And you know, I think we know very well how to build powerful open source on top of object-oriented languages. So the mechanisms are all there for you to create and share back your own patterns. And the last one is it's object-oriented. And that doesn't sound so special because these days almost everything is object-oriented and we sort of take it for granted. But I think it's good to take a step 
back and remind ourselves what all the cool things that come with having an OO language. So the first part is we gain abstraction, right? We can make abstract constructs. We can encapsulate data and functionality in the same place. And that is really the foundation for most of domain modeling that we're so fond of, right? Without OO, it would be very hard to think that we have domain-driven design and, and all the bounded context, right? A lot of that language that we use there is fundamentally based on the notion of having object-oriented mechanisms at place and then testability also, right? Making mock objects, things that look the same from the outside but have a different behavior on the inside. Most of that is based on object-oriented constructs. So let's not forget how much we have gained over the last, I would say, 30 odd years by being able to use object-oriented languages and object-oriented constructs. So, and if we map that to automation, we could imagine that we can do some pretty cool stuff. And as I said, me, I did this in the serverless context, and I consider serverless sort of the ultimate cloud native thing. If you were going to build something that's purpose-built for the cloud, where you really take advantage of the cloud as much as you can, right? Serverless is probably the way to do that. Quick reminder, when we say serverless, we often mean Lambda, but that wouldn't be doing it justice. To me, serverless is not a compute runtime model, but it's actually an ecosystem. Because if you're building these fine-grained distributed applications, you also need to consider how you connect them. So you want to look at things like queues or SNS channels. You want to look at orchestration with step functions. You want to look at event routing with event bridge. And you probably need a different kind of database, right? If you look carefully at DynamoDB, you realize that it's actually very nicely built towards serverless application. Like my favorite things in Dynamo is it has atomic list append and atomic increment functions. So if you think about an event-driven application where you have stuff coming in that you need to aggregate without dealing with transactions and retries and all sorts of other weird stuff, having atomic operations for a parent is actually fantastic. So you realize that this thing has a cohesiveness to it, that it was created, an ecosystem that was created to build a certain style of application. And that's a very fine-grained, often event-driven or asynchronous kind of application. So there's quite a lot in here. So when we talk about serverless automation, we don't mean just you know, provision my Lambda function. We really talk about pulling all these pieces together to build a distributed asynchronous application, right? And as I said, they're like small pieces loosely joined. So wiring them together, right? Remember our four layers, right? Wiring them together is actually one of the most important parts. And that's easy now for me to highlight, right? If I was gonna say in serverless automation lane, what other those four is the most prevalent one, I would vote for the composition because quite honestly, the provisioning that's done for you, like the name server, Let's suggest that infrastructure resource provisioning, you don't really need to do anymore. That's we do for you. Deployment has also become very easy. Like here's a zip file, here's a source, right? Like deployment is no longer such a big deal, but then because you make smaller pieces, composition becomes very important. What's the granularity? How big or how small are my lambdas? What depends on what? What text talks to what and how does it talk? Does it talk synchronously? Does it talk asynchronously? Suddenly those become very important, right? What is my data flow? What is my control flow of my application? What is my topology, you might say? That is all defined in the automation. So I would make the case here that serverless automation is very much about composition, putting the pieces together. Making the pieces is easy. Now the emphasis is on how they're being put together. So here, one of my, my statements that is serverless automation is primarily about composition and perhaps configuration as well, but it's not about the lower part, it's clearly about the upper half of our automation stack. And correspondingly, when yeah, I mentioned that there's community efforts to define serverless patterns, almost all of those patterns are compositional kind of patterns, right? It's like, you know, and, yeah, API gateway to Lambda, actually we don't need that anymore because Lambdas now have, have URLs, right? Or is Lambda, SQS, Lambda, almost all of them are things that compose multiple parts together. So that gives us a hint that this idea of composition, of combining, of wiring things together is actually one of the most useful things to do with 
serverless automation in CDK and you know, have a look at all these kind of resources, you will find that most of them are related to composition. So now let's apply this, right? Let's take an example. And I gave myself the cheeky title here of composing serverless application with automation abstractions, because if our opt automation is object oriented, I can choose abstractions because I like to have fun. I use the example from the enterprise integration patterns, 2003. So soon this thing is gotta be 20 years old. And it turns out that this simple example is still a great test case for building distributed applications and yeah, evaluating platforms that these distributed applications run on. Just quickly explained, it's sort of basically a mortgage broker kind of scenario, much simplified domain where somebody wants to get mortgage quotes. So they go talk to a loan broker. The loan broker will request some additional information about this person from the credit bureau, like the credit score. And then they will request quotes from multiple banks and select the best quote for the customer. You know, seems simple enough, but it has just enough nuances and complexities to be a good example for building distributed application. So I went on built this on AWS serverless. And the first thing that I noticed is that we really have made a lot of the past problems gone away. You know, I no longer need to install software on different machines. I don't need to do anything manually. This is all running in the cloud, right? This is all, I did not install a single thing on my machine. I even used, you know, cloud nine and the cloud shell to do all this. My goal was I'm not installing anything. I'm not going to have a single thing on my local machine. And I was able to do that. Yeah, and I think it's good to remind ourselves how much progress we have made there. And the key patterns I used, you know, this coming from enterprise integration patterns is, so I used orchestration that basically defines the steps, right? First, we go to the credit bureau, then we sort of pops up, we fan out to the banks, and then we re-aggregate the results and give it back to the requester. Those are two key patterns, right? This orchestration is more like kind of like a workflow, right? Something stateful and then scatter gather is the notion of sending messages to multiple recipients and bringing the results back together, right? And this is sort of the high level view that I would have. And unsurprisingly, this maps really well to the AWS serverless services I have and probably other cloud providers very similar, right? The step functions on the left, of course, the functional modules, those are lambdas, right? They're serverless functions. I have a pub sub channel, that's SNS. I have a message filter where I implemented that in EventBridge. And then on the return side, I have SQS as a message channel. I have another lambda, and here's my favorite DynamoDB that helps me with the aggregation. And yes, it is totally using the list append function. And then you can see there's a little bit of a callbacks so that asynchronous response response kind of mechanism that when I have the responses in, I can complete my workflow. Side note, I find this way of visualizing um, solutions, I was gonna say serverless, but any cloud solutions, I find this way much more expressive than just showing the icons. I know we're very proud of our icons and we love drawing pictures with the icons, but let's say you draw event bridge somewhere. What does this mean, right? You could be filtering messages, you could be transforming messages, you could be doing some fan out, right? There's probably a half a dozen different things that you could be trying to accomplish when you draw an event bridge icon with the other ones even more so. So drawing the patterns reveals much more about the intent that you have. And then the product icon to me should just be a decorator. I want to filter messages and I happen to do this in EventBridge, I also could have written another function for it. So I think using the patterns and these ways of, of visualizing the architectures is much more expressive. The product choice or the service choice is something that comes at the very end. So make sure you express your intent, not just the services that you chose. So that advice is coming from a vendor who makes services. So take it, take it to heart. So how do we go from there to automate this kind of solution, right? Like that's our experiment. So again, we have the CDK kind of level constructs. Like the language that we will use is your know, step functions, event bridge, SQS, SNS, you know, Lambda, Dynamo, DB, right? That's the base language. But we can layer another language on top. And we've already heard from that language. Aggregator, publish, subscribe, scatter, gather, message filter, content filter, and that is a completely different language. That's the language of 
integration pattern. <laughs> Excuse me, that's the language. One second here. That's the language that expresses your intent, right? What are you trying to build? And then on top of it, you have the language of your business domain. You talk about banks and loan brokers and quotes. And I think what good design has taught us is to separate those languages. When we talk about bank, we don't talk about Lambda. And when we talk about message filter, we don't talk neither about bank nor about Lambda. It's very good to treat those as three distinct layers in your system and use the respective language. And the second thing that we learn is, well, we like executable languages, right? It's nice to have a language on the poster on the wall, but it's much nicer to make a language that's actually executable. Well, and it turns out we have many tools to allow us to do that. So let's apply that. Let's use the higher level languages that we just defined, right? Not just sort of, you know, step functions, even bridge, you know, SNS, use the language of the patterns and the language of the business domain. Now let's start simple. Let's start with the banks. The banks are really just two, two or three Lambda functions that listen to an SNS channel. So I start very simple. Here's a piece of CDK code. And this code is called create a bank. So I'm using my top layer vocabulary. I'm talking about my business domain. And most things here, we can talk about abstraction leakage later, right? Most of the things are from my business domain language. A bank has certain um, characteristics, like in this case, what kind of loans, you know, what's the maximum loan they would give, the minimum credit score they would service. Remember, it's a simplified example, right? But this is all language from a business domain. You could almost show this to a business user and say, should the pawn shop, you know, serve credit score 400 and up or credit score 450 and up? And they would be able to edit this code and say, now it should be 450. I'm going to make that change right here. There's a little bit of composition as well, right? Because there's the mortgage quotes bus, and that tells where the quotes actually go. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, maybe not 100% clean, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to see sort of how far I can get. And we can see coming back to our four layer model that this includes deployment. Right, like which function am I or which source code am I actually using? What's the name of this resource? It's configuration, right? What are the parameters of the bank, the characteristics, and it's composition, like where do the quotes go? Right. This is topology. And implementing this in CDK, okay, I could be sneaky and say it's a one-liner because technically it is. I broke this down to make it a little bit easier. Right. You can see how these essentially just become parameters that get passed through. Here is CDK language, lambda dot function. This is the context. You pass the name. Here's the actual code being specified. Bank is my, is, is my source for this, the handler. And then I pass in the functional parameters through environment variable. And you see there's some nice thing here at the bottom with event bridge destination. And that is using lambda destination. So when the lambda function completes and calculates the code, that the next thing we will do is actually send this message to an event bus. That's composition, right? That's the, the green part. But it's essentially a one-liner, and now I can code. If I want two banks, right? I make two lines. I can make four loops. I can read a file with all the characteristics of all the banks. I can make a GUI, whatever I want, right? I have full programmability over what kind of banks I want here, and it's just regular code, just like any other code. And the implementation is literally a one liner. So let's take this a level further because uh, this was still very simple. So when we use these lambda destinations, right? I said the destinations are a way to trigger a follow on action when your lambda function concludes, right? Very nice thing because you can take this out of your application code. The composition is no longer in your application where you say, oh, now take this data and publish it to this SNS or this SQS you know, queue, let's say, which is passed in as an environment variable. That's kind of modeling composition in functionality. So you do not need to write any functional code for this composition. You say, attach a destination to this Lambda and the infrastructure takes care of passing the return data from your function to the next element. That's really, really Nice because you separate the composition from functional logic as you should. There's always a slight catch though. And the first catch is when you do that, 
AWS appends or uh, no, it doesn't append, it wraps your data with a giant event envelope, right? The date where it came from just like is like, like a dozen fields that it wraps around that quite honestly our aggregator doesn't want. So we use a content filter for that. And the other thing is not every bank will return a valid response. And the aggregator also doesn't want to deal with invalid messages, just waste resources. So we also want to filter invalid messages. So we use two patterns here. The first pattern is the message filter. Very easily explained pattern. Messages come in, it applies a predicate. Messages that comply with the predicate get passed on. Other messages do not get passed on. Right? So it filters out messages. The second one is a content filter that's different. It doesn't eliminate messages, so one in, one out, but it eliminates fields from a message. Like in our case, we want to get rid of this event envelope. Very common integration patterns in the enterprise integration patterns book and our level two vocabulary, right? This is language out of our middle layer. We're not talking banks. We're not talking the you know, SQS here. We're talking patterns. So let's implement those. So we made some helper functions and we have some methods for that. And you know, they're static methods in this case because they're very common operations. The first one is we only want to let messages through that have a bank ID. So if a bank responds with something empty, we use that as an indicator that that wasn't a valid quote. And again, you could show this probably to a business user and say, what's the best field to check for that the bank produced a valid quote. Is it the bank ID? Is it the quote field? Right? Can be discussed. And you can make that edit right here. And then the second one is because it's so common that we only want the payload of the event and not the whole envelope. Again, we made a static method for that and just say there's a payload filter, right? Which just like takes an event in, gets rid of all the wrapper, and passes on only the payload. And then we pass those two elements into a construct, right? It's the non-empty quotes only and the payload only kind of filters, right? And then we pass this into a construct that's called message content filter. Now that's basically all there is, right? This way I can filter messages and I can filter content, exactly what I had in the picture. How is this implemented? It's almost a one-liner, not quite, right? What I need underneath is an AWS construct like bottom layer of our vocabulary that actually implements that. And in our case, that is event bridge. Event bridge has patterns that it evaluates. So they're perfect for message filtering. If something doesn't match the pattern, the message doesn't go through. And it also has targets and the targets include transformations, which are very suitable to content filters. So you can see at the bottom, the static method, there isn't much in here. The static method, as you would have guessed, is just making a message filter with a particular predicate. It uses some you know, string-based syntax here, field, you know, bracket, you know, that's document-oriented language, right? Angle bracket curly braces, exist equals true, right? It encapsulates that so people using this don't need to use, they don't need to know that particular syntax. So that's about that. And similarly, for the content filter, right? The implementation again, static method there that you know creates an instance of this payload filter. And again, it doesn't do much but except have this magic JSON path. It just knows where the payload is inside an event envelope, right? It's the root, then it's detail, then it's response payload. So it only gets that part of the event and all the other stuff goes away. So very simple and there of type content filter and message filter. They're just special instances that are pre-configured. Now, what I can do is I can take those two instances and pass it to my message content filter. And the implementation of that message content filter is event bridge. So you will see at the bottom things like you know, add event pattern. Those is, that's event bridge language. That's lower level of our three languages. Now we're mapping the middle layer of message filter and content filter to AWS constructs, right? Because ultimately we want this to run. So we have things like targets, you see SQS queues, you see rules, you see add event pattern. That is the language of event bridge that then implements the patterns, but that is all hidden inside the message content filter. Now, if you reflect a little bit on how far 
have we gotten or not gotten? I think fundamentally, I like this a lot because you can use a language on top here that's much closer to your domain language, but at the same time is executable code that will deploy resources in the cloud, scalable, the whole shebang. So I think that is amazing. There's sort of a few things where the abstraction isn't 100%, and the common saying is all abstractions are leaky. So if we didn't have these simple cases, these helper functions, the expression language will likely leak through. And I would not recommend anybody make their own new expression language. So you just use the one that's there, but you could say a bit of my lower layer, you know, leak through into the middle layer. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's okay. And the other thing that leaks through is that event bridge is a combination of a pattern, a small pub sub, and it's a pattern being a filter expression, a small pub sub and a target, and the target can also transform. So the fact that we have something called a message content filter that happens to be the combo of a message filter and a content filter is a little bit influenced by the kind of things that we have underneath. Now, people have taken or are taking these ideas further, and you might have heard the notion of a cloud compiler, where basically you could define your logical elements on top in a any order or any way that you want. It's like a content filter, a queue, message filter, and then the cloud compiler figures out what is the best mapping to the infrastructure underneath. And they could sort of group a content and message filter, say, ah, that's a perfect combo for event bridge. I didn't go that far, but there's a lot of interesting work happening here to you know, take this a whole level further. So what we have learned, right, coming a long way here, that automation, we already learned, is not about efficiency, but we also now learned that automation gives us really powerful abstractions. I can express the topology of my application and the intent and the message routing in programmable, executable, executable code. And that is an amazing thing to do with automation. I'm now coding the topology of my application and I'm also coding some of the behaviors behind it. So what we're really finding here, the language we're defining is it's a domain model, not for your application's business domain, but for your application's topology. Here's a function, here's a queue, here's a message filter, here's an aggregator, here's a scatter gather, here's an orchestrator. That is, and they're wired together, right? Like the destinations. We defined a domain language for our application topology. And I think that is really amazing. And I come back to my original statement saying that that is not infrastructure as code. And I don't know yet what the best name is, but maybe this is architecture as code. And it's interesting, they just talked about you know, architecture and code. So here's a piece of architecture as code. This is not a picture on the wall. This is executable code, or maybe this should be called Topology as code is definitely not infrastructure, it's something much, much more powerful. And just as a closing reminder, why am I so enamored with being able to program my application's topology? The reason for this, and this is sort of the mandatory picture I have in every talk, is that the way your application is put together defines most of its essential properties. The topology is critically important. Yeah, tier two systems consisting of the same components A, B, C, and D. All that's different is they're wired together differently. Now, would you guess that they have different essential properties? And the answer is, of course, they do. They're almost the exact opposite. The left hand side has clean dependencies, so it has easy replaceability. If you want to take C out and replace it with something else, easy to do, but it probably has higher latency and perhaps also single points of failure. The one on the right hand side is the exact opposite. It will have short latencies and it will have high resilience, but it has more interdependency, so it will be harder to replace a component. They are the exact opposite of each other, and the only difference is in how they're wired together, only with a lot of air quotes. So the topology is critically important, and being able to program your topology in a domain language, to me, is a very big deal. So to wrap this up, and I know this is the last talk of the event, the heads must be full. What have we made here? Is this a deployment, a configuration, or a programming exercise? And I would say the boundaries have really blurred, and that is a good thing. My favorite example is 
You could write Lambda code that sends a message to SQS if you could do this inside your Lambda code. Or you could write CDK code that attaches a destination to your Lambda and sends the message for you. So you accomplished exactly the same thing once in application code and once in automation code. And that tells us that the two things aren't actually all that different. And I think, in, especially in serverless land, that is really, really powerful. I can achieve the same things with code here or code there. So I should probably also use the same kind of languages to accomplish those two. Now, when we program something, we want expressive languages, right? Like domain-driven design and domain-specific languages have propelled us so far ahead. So we should use the same thing here. So we're defining a language for loosely coupled distributed solutions, and that language is executable. Enterprise integration patterns were largely pictures. These things are no longer pictures. They're actual methods and classes, and they are deployable, and you get a running solution. Right? And CDK allowed us to make that translation from our domain language for the topology to executable constructs. So when I run the CDK, I have the lambdas and the banks and the queues and the aggregator running, and I can call the endpoint, and the thing is fully functioning. No manual steps whatsoever. So the cool thing is that we're really now coding the serverless solutions in a domain language made for this purpose. And my goal would be to further enrich and enhance that language and build more of these patterns. So what we learn here, coming back to automation, you know, automation as efficiency is sort of seen as an afterthought. You're doing all this stuff manually, it's toil. I should kind of automate that. That's sort of 2007 kind of automation, I would say. Modern automation, cloud automation is not an afterthought. It impacts the architecture choices. The more automation I have, the finer grained I can be, the more resilient that I can come. And as I said, it blurs, blurs the lines. I could send the message from application code, and I can also send it from platform automation code. So this is now an integral part of your application delivery, not a convenience or efficiency kind of thing. And that's why I think we should enhance the name. So my closing picture here is I had a lot of fun with my engine room visit, and I hope you guys found this interesting as well, that if you put together serverless, fine-grained, fully automated, you don't need to deal with infrastructure kind of, kind of things, right? If you take that together with the patterns that let you express the intent of these distributed applications, and you have an object-oriented language to make that executable and actually deploy that into the cloud, now that's what I would call modern application development the way it was meant to be. And with that, the code is all available. There's a QR code here. Um, it's on serverless land. And my buddy Louis actually developed most of this. As I said, there are a lot more resources from my end. I just blogged about um, serverless portability, how you make things easier to port from one platform to another. That is on all on my architectelevator.com blog. So I also invite you to have a peek there. And with that, we have a few minutes left for a question. So I hope you found this interesting. And I really look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much. I'm pretty excited because I've been waiting all day for someone online to submit a question. I actually got one, so I'm going to start with that. Uh, so this, oh, one's, <laughs> this one's from uh, Kevin Elliott, uh, and he said, naming things has come up a few times at this conference. I know we unfortunately can't go back in time, but if we could and we renamed infrastructure as code to something more accurate like infrastructure as config, do you think that would help make naming things easier slash clearer now? Uh, quote, as actual code, end quote, seems like a workaround because as co code was already used, but it introduces a new concept of actual code versus code. <laughs> yeah, and in the end, I, I feel like you got to face the realities. The term has become so sticky. So I actually ran a, a Twitter poll, which I said, like, what do you consider serverless automation? Is it infrastructure as code? Is it application composition? Or is it sort of both, it's just automation? 60% actually voted for infrastructure as code. I'm like, how can this be? Because serverless, the whole point is not to deal with infrastructure. So I think the terms are just sticky and sort of trying to rename them is probably not, yeah, not a easy maneuver.
So what we tend to do, we define new terms, which is also not great, but it's easier than trying to redefine what the old one is. So I would really like folks to rather talk about, you know, topology as code or just call it cloud automation. I think, you know, naming it something that is not infrastructure might help get us in the new mindset. But I fear that trying to sort of repurpose the old one is going to be tricky. They're pretty sticky terms. And yeah, Keith would have to rename his book if he were going to redefine it also. Um, CDK is code generation. So um, when, when I think you had one, one slide there where you had uh, a VPC, you said it was one line, and that turns into 127 lines of probably potentially incomprehensible cloud formation. Uh, sounds like a lot. Yep. Um, that there's probably a group of people around here who've been a, around here a long time and know I have been bitten at some point by code generation. Like, what's different now? What's uh, how do we know that we're not repeating past mistakes? Yeah, and that's a really good question, right? So there's you know cloud formation underneath. I think it was actually 270 lines. So how do you deal? And what we have learned with code generation is how good is the abstraction? Like, how many times do you have to go down? to the next lower level. And I think we have learned sometimes painfully where the answer lies. So to me, I like to use two different metaphors. The one is code generation, the other one is a compiler, right? A compiler in some way is also code generation. It generates a lower level code, but we rarely have to go and look at that generated code. And the question is, why is that, right? I always say, take your even the, take a Java developer, right? Probably a low percentage number of Java developers actually look at the bytecode, right? And 95% don't. And the machine code underneath the virtual machine, probably like hardly anyone ever ever looks. So it is it is doable. It does does work. What do I think is important to make it work? The one thing is, I think you need really solid abstractions. You need a well-rounded model that allows you to set expectation. So if you do something in this higher level model, you need to have a good expectation of what would happen and it, what you expect should actually happen. And that's not easy to do. Like in, often we find those when we have a really strong underlying model, like object oriented or take SQL, right, with relational algebra. So we need a solid foundation. You don't just like code up some convenience classes, right? That is definitely not going to do the trick. So you need a a very solid abstraction and a, a, a solid underlying model for that abstraction. That's number one. And number two, what if something goes wrong, right? So let's take Java again, right? You have a runtime exception. What happens? It doesn't tell you where in the bytecode the problem is, but it gives you a stack trace. Okay, we don't like stack traces that much, but at least it translates the problem back into the source domain. It says like, hey, the the problem was at line X, Y, Z of, of your class A, B, C, and that way you're back in your original domain. And I think those are the two really important capabilities to allow you to stay at the higher level abstraction, which we often have seen in code generation hasn't happened where there's sort of a little bit of abstraction here. And as soon as something goes wrong, we had to pop down. I have a sort of slogan for this, right? And it says, we need abstractions not illusions like code generation i think often have been illusions they pretend that we have this higher level thing but it doesn't quite work and boom you're back down in lower layer and that's when you have all the pain points that you have with with code generation so i think that's what we've learned and now you know what we need to do is uh, apply this to these kind of models to make sure that the cloud formation is really just like machine code or bytecode, something that we would rarely, rarely, rarely ever look at and not something that is like code generation. All right, well, uh, just wanted to say thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation and as usual, very well articulated. Gregor, um, please join me in giving Gregor an awesome round of applause.